Good evening and welcome to Science City, Has Melbourne Got What It Takes? A Melbourne conversation brought to you by the City of Melbourne. I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Kulin Nation, traditional owners of this place we know today as Melbourne, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. My name's Peter Mayers, I'm an adjunct fellow at the Institute for Social Research at Swinburne University and a contributing editor to the online journal Inside Story. And I'm really pleased to be hosting tonight's discussion. Uh, there will be no set piece presentations, it really is a conversation with our five eminent scientists, Sir Gustav Nossel, Dr Crystal Evans, Dr Andrew Nash, Dr Ji Hun Kim and Professor Peter Taylor. I'm going to introduce them to you more fully as they, as I come to engage them in conversation, but please join with me now in making them welcome. <laughs> Our key question tonight is whether we can declare Melbourne to be a city of science. And it's worth pondering why we might ask this question in the first place. Part of the answer must be, I think, that science matters for the prosperity of this city and the prosperity of the nation. It's clear that we can't rely on traditional manufacturing to generate wealth and jobs in the future, nor can we rely forever on selling ever more raw materials to China. We live in a global knowledge economy where to succeed means to excel in innovation and ideas. And recent research in economics shows something very interesting. The more knowledge intensive our economy becomes, the more proximity seems to matter. It's often argued that modern communication technologies mean the death of distance, but it seems in fact that as we move up the escalator of knowledge, the opposite is true. Face-to-face -face communication is essential, perhaps even more essential than ever before. A high-end company with highly qualified workers seems to benefit from being, being located together with other high-end companies with high-knowledge workers, highly skilled workers. Regardless of whether we're talking about private companies or publicly funded research institutes, the intellectual ecosystem in which an enterprise is located seems to be crucial to its success. So that's why, that's an economic argument for why Melbourne needs to be a city of science. The clustering of ideas and knowledge increases our productivity and our competitiveness. But there are many other reasons, of course. We need science to help us solve the pressing problem of our age, environmental issues, climate change, health issues like obesity or dementia, the challenges of achieving international development and increasing human dignity in a world of seven billion people. Beyond that, there's the excitement, of promise, the excitement and promise of science for its own sake, its capacity to advance our understanding of ourselves and of the world around us. So I'm going to kick off our conversation by asking each of our guests in turn to tell us what excites them about science right now. First of all, Sir Gustav Nossel, one of Australia's most distinguished scientists and humanitarians, director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute for a very long time, a professor of medical biology at the University of Melbourne, president of the Australian Academy of Science, winner of many awards and prizes, knighted for his contributions to immunology, uh, and known in Australia for his commitment to causes like Aboriginal reconciliation and causes like global development. So Gustav, what uh, excites you about science right now? Thank you very much, Peter, and my answer is going to surprise you. Uh, I'm a guy who has never done a useful experiment in his whole <laughs> life. 40 years of the laboratory bench, all of it spent trying to figure out how this precious immune system of ours really actually works. Simply asking, as Julius Sumner Milner said, why is it so? How is it so? Just basic science, pure science. Now, I'm a reformed character. <laughs> what excites me most about science in Melbourne right now is that there has been a tidal wave change in respect of our thinking about the developing world, about the third world. And indeed, I am proud of the fact that Melbourne is now a shining beacon in respect of doing research that is related to diseases of the developing countries, chiefly still communicable diseases. We have, for example, two institutes devoted solely to this cause, the Burnett Institute and the Nossel Institute for Global Health. And we have 
as you'll hear shortly, the Walter and Liza Hall Institute, with a very strong position in malaria. So what excites me now is that that old adage of 90-10, 90% of the world's medical research being done for 10% of the world's population is being turned on its head right here in Melbourne. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, that is exciting, and we might hear a little bit more about some specifics of that. Dr. Crystal Evans is a biomedical scientist at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, the institute that uh, Gus Nossel ran for such a long time, and she is working on a m malaria vaccine. Chris is also a leading advocate for better science funding. She led some protests and rallies against uh, planned cuts to research a couple of years ago. And she's a science communicator. Uh, you might know her as Dr. Crystal from uh, Einstein and Go Go on 3 R F M in Melbourne. Crystal Evans, what's exciting you about science right now? Well, I think um, just picking up on what Gus was saying, um, me personally, I'm a malaria researcher and Melbourne has an incredible international reputation as being a focal point for malaria research. And so uh, that's actually why I moved here. I'm, um, I'm an import. I, uh, I did my undergraduate training uh, at the University of Wollongong at my hometown university. Uh, but I wanted to do a PhD in malaria and that's actually why I moved to, here to Melbourne because there's such a strong malaria research community here in Melbourne. Um, not only at the Walter and Liza Hall Institute but also at the Burnett Institute. Excellent research being done at the University of Melbourne, at La Trobe, at Monash. I mean, almost, um, almost every uh, uh, major research institute in Melbourne seems to have um, some link into the malaria world, um, and I think it's, it's to the credit of people like yourself, um, uh, Gus, because um, that kind of research really flourished under your directorship um, at the Walter Liza Hall Institute, and those people have gone off and, and made their own laboratories throughout Melbourne. And I almost feel like there's this kind of, um, this extended family. We can trace our PhD fathers and grandfathers, <laughs> and we can see who, oh, we're PhD cousins. You know, your, your supervisor did their PhD with my supervisor. And, you know, and so there's this incredible network here. Um, and so I find that very, very exciting. Um, but and how far away, or maybe well, that's an unfair question, but how far advanced is, now let me ask you a prior question. Why does malaria matter so much? Well, malaria is still a leading cause of illness in our region. I mean, we don't have malaria in Australia anymore, um, but in, in our nearest neighbours in Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, um, malaria is still a killer. And, um, and it's a disease that has not only um, health impacts, but also has social and economic consequences as well. And um, Because people, people can't work when they've got malaria fever. People can't fever. work, um, kids can't go to school um, if they've got malaria five times a year. Um, and so, and, you know, parents can't go out to earn a living because they're looking after sick children. And just it just rolls on. And again, it's, um, it, it's also a disease that affects women and children as well. So from a societal point of view, um, there's a lot of inequality about the way in which malaria manifests in these societies. Um, so I just feel that, that Melbourne's doing an amazing amount. And just personally, at the Walter and Liza Hall Institute, one small um, thing I'm excited about is the fact we've just got an insectary. So we actually have... Um, just a, got a what? An insectary, which is where you store insects. Like an aviary for insects. Is yes, that, yeah. and it's for mosquitoes. So <laughs> malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. And we have a new facility now at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute to actually... Um, uh, house and um, grow the mosquitoes that can transmit malaria to is study that, them. Is that like the old era guard ad? I don't know if anyone else <laughs> remembers this, where you used to, they had someone stick their arm in a... In the perspex boxes? In a perspex box or like a fish tank full of mosquitoes. Uh, close, but yeah, we saw them, we saw them in very um, high security, biosecurity containment. But um, at the moment, I think they're um, hatching about two to 5,000 mosquitoes a week. Um, in preparation for doing uh, new kinds of malaria. And so this is really exciting because this, I mean, we can now study the form of malaria that's in the mosquito. And so it, it's, it's a new advance. It's the first facility of its kind in Australia. And um, so that's something I'm personally very excited about. And how far developed is your work on a vaccine? My work on a vaccine, I've recently been very fortunate in receiving funding to take my vaccine into clinical trials in the next few years. So, um, and it's, a, it's an effort that's um, come out of, built on about 20 years of research that's happened here in Melbourne. So it's, it's really um, a continuation of that, of that legacy that, mal but that malaria research has here in Melbourne. Okay. Thanks, Crystal. Dr. Andrew Nash, our, our next guest, is Senior Vice President Research with CSL Limited, global biotherapy company that produces vaccine and plasma products and has its headquarters up the road here in Parkville. 
Uh, Andrew completed his PhD in immunology at the University of Melbourne, worked there for a number of years, and went on to join a, a, a biotech startup that became Zenith Thera Therapeutics. That was eventually um, subsumed, if you like, by CSL, uh, where he is now Vice President of Research, as I said. And Andrew coordinates, that means, CSL's global research activities, leading a team of 60 scientists focused on producing new medicines. So, Andrew, what are you excited about? Uh, uh, many things, Peter, thank you. Um, look, just to clarify one thing right from the start, you know, Gus's reference to the fact that he failed to do a, a significant experiment during his time in the lab. I mean, just so that everybody knows, Gus played a, f a fundamental role in the discovery and uh, the, our knowledge around antibodies and how antibodies are made and the cells that made antibodies. And a few years later, that led to uh, a number of scientists working on how, how to make what we call monoclonal antibodies. And then 30 years later, monoclonal antibodies formed the basis of therapies to treat a whole range of diseases, including uh, various cancers, inflammatory diseases, multiple sclerosis. So I think if you, if you took look at where we are now in terms of our, our new generation of treatments for all of these diseases, you can trace that back to some very important work that Sir Gus did back we, in the 1960s. They didn't give him all those awards for nothing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, what, what's exciting me at the moment, um, look, I work for a, for a pharmaceutical company. We're interested in discovering new medicines, new drugs, and, and to do that, we really focus on really trying to understand the molecular and the genetic basis of disease and then designing drugs based on that knowledge. Um, and I think really in the last, you know, 10 to 20 years, there's been huge strides made in that discovery. So. So with that understanding, we've been able to specifically design and develop new drugs. And in addition to that, we've been able to um, identify the patient groups that are most likely to respond to those drugs and better target our therapy. So, you know, we're much better placed in terms of our ability to develop drugs. There's new technologies around. Science has led to a fundamental understanding of the basis of disease, and we can t use that to our advantage. And then we're employing that same understanding in identifying patients that are likely to respond. And, and at CSL at the moment, we've, we're, we're translating that into our own drug discovery programs, and we've been able to move a number of candidate drugs through into clinical trials in areas like uh, on oncology and, and inflammatory disease. And, and we're really excited about the progress of those clinical studies and looking forward to, to and, the results. And how much of that is happening in Melbourne as opposed to your other centres around the world? Um, look, all of the, uh, the, the discovery, the drug discovery takes place here in Melbourne. Um, that that dis drug discovery, of course, was based on a lot of fundamental biology that also occurred here in Melbourne, much of it at the, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute during the the 70s and 80s uh, in, the, in the cancer unit there led, led by Don Metcalf. So a lot of the basic discovery and, and biology done here in Melbourne, the drug development and optimization work done in here in Melbourne, uh, the initial clinical work uh, sp spread around the globe but also here in Melbourne as well. So we have a, a, a clinical program running in acute myeloid leukaemia now and we have uh, clinical sites here in Melbourne at the Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, under Dr Andrew Roberts but we also have sites in, in New York and Seattle uh, and Philadelphia so mm. you know a global effort but with a lot of activity here in Melbourne as well. Well I mean you've made a couple of links there to the relationship between primary research or pure research and then the applications that might flow from it down the track and that's an issue I think we'll come back to to discuss more. Uh, Dr. Ji Hyun Kim is a developmental behavioural neuroscientist. She's a DECRA fellow in, at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. That's the largest brain research uh, group in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Ji has a particular interest. She did her uh, original study at the University of New South Wales, uh, completed a PhD on memory, and then undertook uh, postdoctoral training in Michigan. Uh, she's currently leading a research team working on memory aspects of early onset anxiety disorders and drug addiction. So, G, uh, are you excited about your own research? Uh, yep. That was the first thing that came into my mind when you said, what is the most exciting thing about science? Like, my research is so exciting. <laughs> but what really excites me um, is actually that early life experiences are finally, finally getting a lot of attention. Um, in education as well as science, in mental health and physical health. Um, 
children, kindies, um, high school students have really been, I feel like, neglected. We really don't understand how their brain works. We really don't understand how their body works. Um, so, but finally, I feel like there's a focus, um, a shift in focus to what happens early in life that may determine the rest of your life. Um, so that's what really excites me. I was um, fortunate enough to be invited to give a TEDx Melbourne talk. And it was interesting because I thought I'll be the only person talking about my early life and how that changed me, how my science teacher you know, is amazing and I'm a scientist now and so on. But everybody else, all the other speakers, whether they were talking about autism or they were talking about you know, having a good laugh about life and not taking yourself too seriously, or whether it was global warming, everybody had a story about how something that happened early in life determined what they feel anxious about or what they feel joyful about later on. So in the, in this, especially in the context of mental health, um, I think it's really exciting time for us um, and start shifting you know, our focus on um, what happens really early in life. And that's what really excites me because I feel like my research can also then make a difference. Okay, thank you, G. Our fifth panellist is Professor Peter Taylor. He's a computational scientist and a chemist. And for the past three years, he's been director of the Victorian Life Science Computation Initiative. And they've brought you this, which I'm going to ask him about, which is up the back. This is from your institute, I think, Peter. Uh, now, the, uh, the Victorian Life Science Computation Initiative is led by the University of Melbourne in collaboration with IBM, and it involves creating a centre of supercomputing to help researchers in life sciences with diagnostics and finding new drug targets and refining treatments and so on. Uh, before coming to Melbourne, Peter was Chief Scientist at the Centre for Scientific Computing in Warwick in the UK. Peter, what's exciting you about science? Thank you, Peter. When the question was originally posed a couple of days ago, I formulated a one-word answer, and I thought then perhaps all the people who'd turned out might feel a bit short-changed by that, so I will say a little bit more. But the one-word answer was data. <laughs> what we can accumulate, whether it's uh, data about ourselves, for example, genomic data, data about the universe that comes in from radio telescopes, or data just from around town, from traffic sensors and things like this. It excites me because on the one hand, it's a huge challenge for people such as ourselves on the computational side to figure out how to manage that, how to store it, how to make, av make it available, what's reliable and what's not. But when you see the potential for things like um, IBM, for example, managed to just about revolutionize traffic flow in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, partly by using sensor data there. Uh, and what you see accomplished now in Melbourne in what I think of as precision medicine, targeting treatments to patients based on specific features of their genomes. The potential here is just stupendous. We're only getting started with this. As I say, there's a lot of work to do, but that's what excites me at the moment. And obviously, the center you run with its supercomputers, I mean, if that data, data is going to be meaningful, you need a supercomputing capacity to, to deal with it? Is that to right? analyze it, yes, mm. in, in most cases. All right. So in my introductory remarks, I talked about the importance of proximity. And I'm wondering if you think, as scientists, if you think that's right, that being part of something, for example, Crystal, you talked about coming to Melbourne because of the leading work being done in malaria. So how important is that proximity to each other and other institutes and other like minds? Well, uh, if I can kick off, Peter, I think it is hugely important. You know, people often ask me, oh, what's it like to lead a life in science? What are scientists like? God damn it, scientists are people. <laughs> scientists are no different in themselves from all of you good 150 or so sitting in the audience, you know? We have kids, we have mortgages, we have our troubles, we have our football teams, and one thing about people is that they strike sparks off other people. So togetherness, proximity, I have the greatest of respect for computers. I wish I knew more about them. But in point of fact, nothing is, Im is as important as the free flow of ideas and the robust discussion 
between people. Now, you know, I think, for example, with the Walter Eliza Hall Institute, it is so lucky to em be embedded in what we call the Parkville Strip. The Royal Melbourne Hospital right next door for the clinical trials. The Flory just across the road. The CSL, wonderful uh, pharmaceutical company, a short distance away in the outer reaches of Parkville. The Women's Hospital, the Children's Hospital, you know? An incredible agglomeration of people. And believe me, these people find one another. Because these days, it's an overused word, but much of biomedical science is interdisciplinary, it's multitask, multi-skilled, much of it in fact uses quite complex and expensive equipment that shouldn't be duplicated. Like, for example, the fantastic mass spectrom spectrometry equipment that lives in the Bio21 Institute, just next door to the Royal Melbourne Hospital. So I actually think proximity is hugely important. Is that, uh, Peter? I, I, I would perhaps put it slightly differently, and I suppose what I'm trying to do here is fight at least some elements of the computer-based corner. Um, I spent a large part of today uh, in a teleconference as part of a committee meeting, a board meeting of a board that I'm on. And that works fairly well, on the one hand because all the members of the board know one another fairly well, and on the other hand, because it's a board meeting, it's really boring. <laughs> you know, it's just agenda items and routine business. There's no creativity in it at all. And when you need to do that sort of thing, then I think teleconferencing, video conferencing is a way to do it. And it saved me having to fly to Canberra today, for instance. But I agree completely with what Gus says. It's if you want anything that has its roots in any sort of creative thinking, then you've got to be around the coffee table with people. I totally agree. I think proximity is so important. That's why I chose to come back to Melbourne instead of where I was raised, um, which is Sydney, because I've heard so many good things about Flory and I wanted to really get into um, molecular mechanisms of memory, especially early in life. And I remember just um, walking past an HR admin person's office and I saw this person and the, the HR admin person um, said to this person, oh, by Tony, and I realized that this was a Tony that I've been hearing about from other people, so I just immediately introduced myself. And um, he's heard about me too, so we shared data and we realized that we had data that was overlapping, and so we wrote a grant together <laughs> just that year, and we submitted it. And, and I can't see those things sort of happening without being in the place where you know there are many brilliant scientists around. And I think proximity is also really important in terms of just interacting and yeah, being creative. There are things that only I believe, I debate about this um, all the time with people, but that only humans can do that machines can't do. Um, machines may become faster in processing speed or you know, be more accurate, but in terms of being innovative and being creative, only when a human is really being human and showing that humane side, I think may really, really come out. And I've really definitely experienced that, especially with my students. And I was saying to Sir Gus before, University of Melbourne students are, so far have been so spectacular. And I learned so much from them. And I think proximity, being able to interact with those sort of young, fresh minds, as well as the more experienced minds, is really, really important in person. And you also get a feel. I'm one of those people who can't separate work from life. And I hate working with jerks. And oftentimes, you can tell better when you talk to them in person, um, yeah. and I try to filter <laughs> my collaborations based on that. So I think proximity is extremely important in science. <laughs> Andrew, um, and is, is, it, is, there also, is it necessary also to have a kind of critical mass? I mean, that there has to be a certain number of uh, people in a field to, to, to make it work? Look, uh, I, th I think that's absolutely true, and, and that's an issue we've, we've sort of dealt with at CSL over the years. I mean, just, just in terms of proximity, the, the main CSL site in Parkville is, is up behind the zoo, and it's, you know, it's only probably two kilometres away from the big hospitals and the big research institutes, but in reality, it may as well have been you know, 10 or 20 kilometres away, and, and, and six years ago, we made the decision to pack up our research and move it from from Parkville up behind the zoo right down into the heart of Parkville, just off Flemington Road and Grattan Street into the Bio21 Institute. So, 
we made the decision that our scientists would be better off in an institute right next to uh, scientists working on, on a variety of other topics, right next to the clinicians that we're seeing and talking to the patients that we wanted to treat, and really, you know, in, in the heart of where the action is in Parkville. And, and really, that's made a, a tremendous difference to our research. We've been able to attract more scientists and better scientists to come and work for us. So that, that would have been an expensive decision to move, you know, a couple of kilometres up the road. Look, it was, was an expensive decision. Certainly, uh, we, we thought long and hard about building... We could have built fancy new buildings and labs up on that Poplar Road site, but we made the active decision known we wouldn't do that. We would invest in that move down into the, to the heart of the Parkville precinct. And because look, six you could years see, on, it's, pay, it's paid huge dividends right. for you us. You could see the synergies that would flow from the yeah. interactions yeah. and the engagements with each other. Yeah. So we have a very medical science heavy a lot of heavies here on the, on the panel. Uh, Crystal, are there other things that Melbourne is good at, apart oh. from medical science? Well, I mean, medical, uh, Melbourne is often described as the medical research capital of Australia, so we do have a very... Um, I think Melbourne's very proud of its um, biomedical research, but um, Melbourne excels in, in other areas, definitely. I mean, there's a very strong um, astrophysics community, and there's... Um, a coming back to the data uh, question that we're talking about, um, there's some fantastic research being done uh, in uh, climate work, um, and, and, and not just in Parkville. Let's mention um, some of the other great clusters around Melbourne. There's some fantastic work being done out at Monash. Someone called it Car Parkville. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, um, oh, and, and don't forget, we've got the Australian Synchrotron just down the road. I mean, mm -hmm. this uh, is an amazing piece of infrastructure which is accessed by scientists, not only here in Melbourne, but all across Australia. Um, and the applications for which are, are virtually endless. The synchrotron creates brilliant light, which is used to, to look at um, the molecular details of materials, everything from soil to artwork, from paint to proteins to, to drugs. You know, having the Australian synchrotron down the road at Monash is an amazing boon for, um, for Melbourne uh, researchers. So uh, I think that we span the spectrum. But does it mean that there are things that we should say, OK, Melbourne shouldn't go down that field? You know, we should leave that to... No. Yeah. <laughs> no. You never want to draw a line and say, no, we're not going to do that, because you never know when it's going to feed back into something you're really interested in and you're really glad you made happen. And I think that comes back to what G was just saying about innovation. I think that to, 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 to focus too heavily would um, exclude potential innovation. And, and that's because why you don't know how one field is going to inform another? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think at the moment there's a lot of emphasis, or maybe it's not just at the moment, I'm really young so I don't know what happened 10 years ago, but um, emphasis on really like fancy cutting edge techniques and so on. But I think the fundamental questions in science and how you go about answering them may be quite you know, um, immutable. And I think as soon as you start saying no, or as soon as, soon as you start saying, I, ca I can't learn from my students because I have so much more experience, for example, um, I think that's when those questions start to get distorted and you can't answer them as well. So I, my, I totally agree. <laughs> and how important is science to the city? I mean, we, we've talked about the importance of having a, a kind of critical mass and a, of the benefits of all those brains close to each other, whether it's in Parkville or Car Parkville. Um, but how important is the science for the, the city? Well, I think, um, uh, I, th I think that a lot of the, um, the, the love of, of, of science is really starting to come through in Melbourne's cultural um, kind of programs, uh, such as the conversation that we're having here tonight. But also um, there's science streams in the Melbourne Writers' Festival. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of science that's coming through in, in the cultural and social aspects of Melbourne. And, um, and I think the people are, are really interested in science. I mean, uh, and, and are very supportive of science. I mean, uh, you mentioned earlier that I was involved in organising some of the rallies to... Um, to sort of uh, protest against potential funding cuts to science. And I was overwhelmed by the response of Mel the Melbourne community. I mean, we had 5,000 people turn up for a rally um, to support, you know, medical research and, and research more generally here in, here in Melbourne. And, and, and then it turned out there was rallies all across, the uh, all across Australia. So um, I think that there's a really, there's a groundswell, not only just of scientists, but of science-loving um, people in the community. Andrew? Well, look, I think there's uh, probably an overused saying, Peter, that um, great, great cities have great universities and, 
and, uh, and no doubt great universities do great science. All of those, those things go together and uh, if you have a look at you know, the economic impact of having great science within the city, it's very clear there's a lot of employment. Uh, companies like CSL will establish within cities like Melbourne. I think, you know, uh, industry and great science are, are sort of mutually reinforcing. Great industry, great science. Great science means great industry. So I think all of those things work together to mean that, you know, um, science really is, is important to Melbourne and, and uh, you know, companies and the community can benefit hugely from, from quality science. Peter? It seems to me that it's part of a complete culture. You would not expect people to emerge from, let's say, a high school education with no familiarity with the great works of literature, for example. Why would you expect them, or why would you be willing to tolerate them emerging without an, an understanding of science? And the best way to get great literature and great science done is to educate people and emphasize the importance of these things. And I, before anybody gets up and, and criticizes, yes, I know I stole that from C.P. Snow and the, his two cultures reflexes of years ago. The, um, how, does, how does Melbourne compare to, because you've worked in the US, many of you have worked overseas, you've worked in the US, you've worked in the UK, how does Melbourne compare to other cities? Well, my own experience, I suppose, in the, the US was in two large cities, um, the Bay Area, if you regard that as a city, which is bigger than Melbourne, and San Diego, which is smaller. Um, San Diego put a lot of effort into investing into the biosciences, biotechnology, in the early 90s. From what I saw then and what I compare now in Melbourne, I would say they were not overall as successful in that as uh, we've been um, in Melbourne. There are other areas where San Diego is extremely strong. Neuroscience is, is one, but I, I'm aware from the interaction between neuroscientists in San Diego and neuroscientists in Melbourne that we don't play second fiddle in that. I think in the Bay Area, there is an advantage of both Silicon Valley and a very, very large industrial infrastructure left over from um, the sort of uh, manufacturing industry of days gone by. Um, but my own observation has always been that the major cities in Australia, uh, in the area of research, generally science, engineering, and so forth, are more than competitive with their equivalents overseas. Gee, you worked in, in uh, Michigan. And, and you, but you came back to, to Australia, so clearly you felt there was enough on offer for you here? Um, definitely. I mean, I really missed Australian scientists um, as well. It's, it's very different um, experiencing America. And I was only, um, and my contract was for five years, but I came still early because I really miss Australia. But I think um, coming from Sydney as well as um, working overseas, there is a certain label that comes with the city of Melbourne as well as the city of Sydney. Sydney is seen, in my opinion, um, from what I heard, the finest city in the beautiful city of Australia where there was the Olympics. Melbourne is known to be the cultural city where there are arts and creativity and science. So I had, um, I had two bosses, two PIs in America. One boss, when I said, I'm going back to Australia or Melbourne, he said, oh, that's where all the Nobel laureates come from, right, in Australia, which is a really nice thing to say. The other supervisor said, oh, well, it's nice to go to a small university. Melbourne <laughs> University is bigger than Michigan <laughs> University. So that was interesting. Um, but so I think there's that label that comes with the city of Melbourne. And, and culture, culturally, as Peter said, science is so integral to create, like science is such a creative process and it's so integral to um, just the label of city of Melbourne as the cultural city of Australia. I think it's, you can't actually imagine Melbourne without science um, to answer your question. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's what I think about city of Melbourne and science. Mm. I think, uh, Peter, science in Melbourne thrives in, inside academic institutes and the big medical research institutes in, in the universities. Where it does struggle uh, in comparison to some international cities is science within a company environment, within a, within a, a drug discovery environment. You know, uh, in, in, say, Basel in, in Europe, San Francisco, San Diego in the, in, in the US, 
you know, the opportunities for, for scientists to, to work in that industry and uh, our environment are huge. You know, those, those companies have campuses the size of Melbourne University and will employ five, six, seven thousand scientists at, on those one sites. You know, uh, here in Melbourne, um, CSL is by far the biggest employer of scientists. Uh, in terms of basic research, we employ maybe a, a hundred scientists and then there's a sharp drop off. So I think there's great opportunity uh, in, in the academic environment. It would be great if in the future we can create more opportunity for our scientists in that industry environment as well. Well, well let's talk about that because I mean, we've talked about all the, uh, the benefits and, and we've been pretty positive about science in Melbourne, but there are clearly some challenges in Melbourne and in Australia for science. Um, Andrew, why is it hard to develop the sorts of companies we serve overseas here in Australia? Is it a lack of investment capital? Is it a lack of people willing to take a risk on science with their, with their investment? What is it? Look, I, look, I think that's, that's probably true. Uh, you know, if you go back, say, 10 to 15 years into the mid to late 90s, there was a real burst of activity in the biotech sector here in Melbourne, and, and we had probably between 50 to 100 listed biotech companies on the ASX, and there was a developing job market for scientists within that biotech sector. But, but you know, 15 years on, I think uh, we certainly haven't gone forwards. If anything, we've gone backwards. Um, of course, the global financial crisis got in the way, and, and some of the money had dried up, but I think... Uh, the, the willingness of investors to take a long-term view, the sort of view that's required for, for drug development, for example, has, has always been a bit limited here. You know, in, in the US, for example, long-term means 10 to 20 years. Here in Australia, long-term means five years, and, and that just doesn't fit with the way science works sometimes. So, you know, so I'm uh, always uh, hopeful it'll improve. But we don't have enough time. sort of patient capital that's willing to invest in the long term? Look, that's... that's true and we've always had great opportunity for venture capital out in the outback and in far western Australia to, to dig a hole and see what you can find and sometimes that's easier than you know, slaving away on the lab bench for, for 10 years. Gus. I think that uh, this is an important discussion. Um, we do have venture capital but the point is it's not enough and it's not patient enough and we have very, very little mezzanine financing. So, what so what, what's mezzanine financing? It's the state. Well, you go from an well, you go from your own personal wealth when you mortgage your house and do a bit of work in your garage, right? Mm -hmm. From that, you go to angel financing, which means uh, you find some person through your networks who will give you three hundred thousand, half a million, and a fair chunk of the IP. Then to venture capital. Then the next stage, when you need five, 10 million, you need that mezzanine capital. We don't do that. What we do is we go to an initial public offering to the mums and dads as well as the instos. Too early, always too early in the life of a particular uh, discovery or particular set of discoveries. And therefore, that 10 to 12 years, uh, which Andrew mentioned, which takes for a drug to, from discovery to actual you being able to get it in the pharmacy. Uh, and 10 to 12 years is conservative, might be 15. We don't have that kind of uh, patience. Now, I have one controversial thing to say here. And I know everybody in the world wants a bit of the $1.6 trillion pie that is our superannuation. But the fact of the matter is, if one were to take 1% of all your super, 1%, we would have a potential pool of money which deployed for uh, high-tech ventures would make a very big difference. Now, I know about fiduciary responsibilities, I know about the prudent person rule and so forth, but for heaven's sake, the average person's super is an investment for 20 to 30 years. And if we can't tap into a proportion of that soberly, responsibly, with nine companies being a failure, but the tenth being the success that might um, uh, multiply your capital by a hundredfold. I'll tell you a lovely story. Andrew and I heard this the other day. Well, he knows it well. We were at the retirement, one of the probably many retirement functions for Brian McNamee, the chief executive of CSL. CSL was valued at $23 million when he took over. CSL today is in the 20 plus billion dollar 
$30 billion. There's a factorial factor of 1,000. Now, what about if some of the venture capital had gone into CSL at that time? and you've made a thousand times, you can have a lot of failures for I, that, Peter. <laughs> I, would, I would be very happy if some of my super had been in that particular investment. And it, it's interesting because superannuation, when, if I remember correctly, when Paul Keating brought it in, part of the idea was to make us more responsible for our own retirement in our old age, but part of it was to create a pool of domestic capital so we weren't so dependent on offshore borrowing. Um, but uh, Peter and then Andrew. And uh, Gus made another point there as well, uh, that what if we'd invested this and nine companies had failed, but the tenth had been a world performer? And that raises a, an, an attitude problem that I think we have in this country and that, for example, we have in Britain, which is we grow up learning that bankruptcy is a badge of shame. In the US, if you haven't had a couple of startups go bankrupt, no venture capitalist is going to want to talk to you because you clearly aren't being adventurous enough or creative enough in what you do. And we, I, I think we have to be much better at learning how to declare failure and move on sometimes. Um, and I think there is a degree of entrepreneurialism you see in the US, partly influenced by that attitude that, yeah, okay, we tried, the company failed, let's do something else, that, that I don't see as prevalent here or say in the UK? I do think, oh sorry, did no, you stay, no. Andrew? Um, there is the sort of conservative, let's not take any risk sort of um, attitude in Australia um, and research funding because when I was in America and participated in um, writing up grants, there was this um, idea that if you had an amazing um, publication, an amazing discovery that was quite influential and that was the only publication potentially that you had in five, six years, that was still okay because maybe then you have another potential for another discovery and another amazing impact that you can make. But in Australia, um, even my colleagues who are from overseas, from Europe as well as America, say that Australian grant system is so difficult because it's so risk averse. You have to have a ton of critical mass of little publications to prove that you can always publish, no matter the quality of the paper. And then if you have once in a while good papers, then, then maybe you are okay for us to give you money to carry on this research. So you have to be good at both. And so people, even people who want to do risky things and make big discoveries are so afraid to do them because what if it fails and then I'll never get funding ever again and you know, I'll never be able to flourish this idea. So I think I think that is, uh, I agree, there is this risk averse attitude um, that, you know, people are very, um, that may hold Melbourne back in big, being the big science city. Let's look at some of the other aspects of public funding, because I think too, I'm right, aren't I, G, that in Australia, um, funding is quite short term, like it's three years for yep. most, most research projects, and three years, as Gus was suggesting earlier, in the life of a research project is not very long. Yes, that's very short. Um, typically, in most other countries, a typical project funding, regardless of which area, is five years. And that's um, still, you know, people complain it's short. But three years in Australia, in both ARC and NHMRC discovery projects and, pro um, you know, project grants and NHMRC, three years is way too short to actually flourish and really delve into and make a great discovery. So that is very, something very different about Australian grant system. And Crystal, uh, the pool of funding itself that you're all competing for, is it big enough? Uh, how long's a piece of string? <laughs> um, but I think, um, I think G's right in that, that in a restricted funding situation, uh, people do want to only ever back winners. And so when you write a grant, um, because there is such a limited pool of resources, you always want to give it to someone who's going to be successful, which means that you're only ever going to get incremental increases in knowledge, that you, that you don't really have a blue sky um, kind of funding pool here. Um, I, I know this because um, my, my research was actually initiated by a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through a program they have called the Grand Challenges Exploration. And what they do is they just say, you know, don't write a 200 page grant, just send us one page with your idea. And then we'll give you a little bit of startup money um, to see how you go. And then you can then use that kind of 
short time. So it, it is actually a short amount of money, but it's, so it's just for a year. But then that lets you kind of explore something that's radical, that's left field, that's, that's more innovative. And then so from that year, you can then generate some data to then apply to the kind of more traditional funding schemes like the NHMRC, which I'm you know, fortunate enough to sort of fund my research through now. But, um, but you wouldn't have got there, is what you're saying, without that mm. initial one year from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Yeah, I needed that someone. enabled you to do something a bit riskier or yeah. pursue a path that wasn't well trodden? Yeah, so um, I'm, t I'm um, sort of putting together a malaria vaccine that's based on a, on a live organism, which is a very new approach that's never been done before. So, um, so yeah, if it wasn't for that international sort of um, pump priming, um, that, that, that idea wouldn't have gotten off the ground. So I just, I feel like Australia lacks that kind of um, innovative sort of um, blue sky, kind of left field funding mechanism. I'm going to invite you in the audience to join in this conversation in a moment, but I'll just see if there's any other comments on funding from, from the members of the panel. Look, uh, maybe from, a, from an industry perspective, Peter, both the two big funding agencies in Australia, the NHMRC and the ARC, both That's have... The National Health and Medical Ma Research Council and Australian, yeah, Australian Research, Research Council. Council. Yeah. They both have programs that are specifically designed to bring uh, industry researchers and academic researchers together to, to, to push developments forward. And, and those schemes are relatively effective. We at CSL access them quite frequently. But again, they're, they're three-year schemes and it's difficult to achieve a lot in, in three years. And I think um, the more that the government can support uh, the bringing together of researchers in those two environments, I think the, the, better is, the better chance that you'll translate some of those opportunities into outcomes for the community. So as well as taking 1% of our superannuation for investment in venture projects in science, we should also be, uh, the government should also be adjusting its science funding to be over longer time frames. Look, I think so, and I, I did see a couple of press releases this morning, one from, from the opposition, uh, reiterating their commitment to uh, extend the funding to five years rather than three. And I, you know, uh, I certainly think most of my academic colleagues would, would relish the opportunity to work over a five-year period or a five-year cycle rather than a three-year cycle. Gus? Uh, I'm just responding to your question to Crystal as to whether uh, we think the granting mechanism has got enough money in them. I uh, want to lighten the atmosphere by referring to a question that my close colleague, and some of you might know, Graham Mitchell, once asked me, he said, Gus, where do you think is the most dangerous place in the world to stand? And I said, oh, maybe the demilitarised zone in North Korea or uh, somewhere in Iraq? Or... He said, no. He said, anywhere between a scientist and a pot of money. <laughs> <laughs> now, the fact of the matter is, no scientist that I've ever met will ever tell you that they have enough money. But I think the National Health and Medical Research Council, which is the pot that we're mainly engaged with in medical science, particularly basic medical science, has been on a pretty healthy growth trajectory. I would like that growth trajectory in a modest and reasoned way to continue. And in point of fact, I point you to a banker, Simon McKeon, mm -hmm brilliant banker, yep. uh, head of some big branch of the Macquarie Bank, who uh, uh, led a review of health and medical research in Australia, taking a 10-year perspective. And that review came to the conclusion that health is an innovation-intensive industry. And what you're doing in medical practice today will be different from what you'll be doing a year from now, and quite different from what you'll be doing a decade from now. So McKeon reached the sober view that an intelligent health system would spend about 3% of its total corpus on R&D. In fact, he said 3 to 4% on research and development. Now, health is about 9% of the GDP, and you could all do the sums, but we're talking then billions, not hundreds of millions. But in a sober, gradual, 10-year extension. And you know, I think a government that picked that up might be on a winner. Mm. Andrew, uh, how much does CSL invest in research? Because presumably that's the future of the company, is to come up with new products and new innovations. Um, so we, uh, in the past 12 months, have probably spent around $400 million 
on research in, in the, the coming 12 months will probably spend about $460 million. Um, I'm not sure what the total NHMRC budget is for a 12-month period. So CSL, in, in and of ourselves, we're spending probably close half. to half, two-thirds of the, the budget. So, but, you know, so that, that, that four to five hundred million dollars is spent on everything from very basic research, where we do a lot of collaborative uh, research with our colleagues within the universities and uh, institutes, all the way through to phase, uh, phase three clinical studies, where we're looking to prove that our, our drugs are working in large, large groups of patients. So it's spread over quite a range of research activity. Um, um, as a proportion of income or profit is, I mean, how much goes back in to the... To well, so um, I guess last, last uh, 12 months CSL probably had around $5 billion in revenue. Uh, that was about $1.2 billion in net profit and of that, um, four to five hundred million back into so R&D. So a significant amount. Yeah. And, and are your investors happy with that or the people who write <laughs> about you for the financial review or whatever, or do they think, oh, you should be giving more of that money to them in terms of dividends? And well, so that's, you know, our, the analysts and our investors are always interested in, in how much we're, we're spending in R&D, and it's a pretty fine balance, but I think uh, the history of CSL would tell you that Brian McNamee has managed to get it pretty right for the last 23 years, so, so we, we think that level of spend is about right and apparently the investors and the analysts are happy with that level of spend as well. But of course we in R&D would always be arguing with those in, in finance and other parts of the business that they should spend more because they'll get a, a better outcome. So, so we have the same arguments in terms of accessing the pool of money available in CSL as, as happens within the rest of the academic community, community accessing funds elsewhere. Well, let's turn to another aspect of the future, and that is the next generation of scientists and science education. And I'm going to invite the first question from uh, Sula Bennett. Uh, Sula is the Director of Quantum Victoria, and she's also President of the Science Teachers Association of Victoria. So Sula, maybe you'd like to make a comment and, and put a question to the panel. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that um, the conversation has been fantastic and from a uh, teacher's perspective, but also working with uh, in partnership um, via the Science Teachers Association of Victoria, but also through Quantum Victoria, which I have to say, we're not only a city that is rich in science institutions that conduct research, Quantum Victoria is one of six specialist science and math centres that the previous um, Labor governments had established, but the existing, the current um, government, state government, is also supporting. And those centres have their own specialisation, work with um, students and teachers and lab techs to support the school community, to support the teaching and learning of science, mathematics, technology and engineering. So um, we're quite unique in, in that way, both nationally and internationally. I've travelled a, a little bit around Australia, but also um, globally, and I haven't seen uh, any city as such um, or province that has the richness um, that we have here. So why aren't we attracting as many students um, to continue uh, in, uh, the, in science as well as mathematics um, and engineering. And, and that's a question that um, my profession has always uh, uh, had issues with, and specifically chemistry and physics. We are still attracting students in uh, the biological sciences. Um, and I'm happy now that there's been a bit more of a blur between the disciplines. And that tends to attract, um, have more of a gender balance, whereas in the past, we probably didn't have that. So, some of you referred to um, your earlier childhood or, or um, uh, some experiences that led you to the path that you were led to, but what advice would you give to um, parents that are here, uh, grandparents, teachers, on how we can inspire through your research uh, future generations to continue um, along the path, but also build on uh, the wonderful work that all of you have done. Who wants to uh, lead off? Peter. This is another problem in risk averseness, I think. When I was a lad in high school, it was fairly routine, even though we were told 
we shouldn't do it, that we would, we would play with beads of mercury and poke them around on a tray. <laughs> You can't even obtain mercury now in the EU without some sort of special certificate, much less use it in experiments. My oldest son um, majored in chemistry in the UK, and in high school they used to be given this fancy glassware which they would assemble into an apparatus, and they would look at it for a while and then disassemble it and put it away because the school could not obtain insurance to cover the costs of them doing actual chemical experiments, the students on their own. I, I fear that unless we are willing to be a little less risk averse, I'm not saying play with mercury, but I do think we need to let kids have a lot more hands-on exposure to science and what are the fascinating things about it if we really want to engage their interest. I think, yeah, A, make science interesting and um, make it look practical and actually teach them more new things and the new research. I still remember um, when I was first year um, university student, I was in a biology, I was in a psychology lecture and they were teaching perception and um, saying that the tongue map, the notion that there's bitterness and there's sourness and um, depending on the area of your tongue was actually completely wrong, that each, um, there was a taste bud that sensed all tastes. And then the next hour, I went to a biology lecture, and they, were, they taught me there's a tongue map, and it was examined, <laughs> and this is in a university, so I can't even imagine what happens in high school, that maybe um, all the new things and um, new, new science isn't being taught. So if those things are integrated and made more practical, interactive, maybe um, people will take more interest in science early age. But that's, I don't think, is the problem. Second thing is the actual quality of teachers. Um, if the teachers need to make it interesting and communicate it. But I think the biggest, to be honest, problem is that even if people are really interested and want to study science, there are no job prospects. Um, I know so many students who go into honours um, in science, and, but they're like, well, we taught that unless we do masters and PhD, we might not get any jobs, but then they enter masters and they, they enter PhD, and then they taught, oh, no, even after a PhD, we don't know whether you can have a job <laughs> in science. So I think there are many aspects um, that may cause that, um, you know, the question, the um, problem, why aren't we attracting people to do science? I think um, other people would have lots to say about that. Well, I think inspirational teachers are really important, and I think um, raising the profile of teaching as a profession, I mean, if we paid teachers properly, if we gave teachers um, yeah. better working conditions and, and more support, then, you know, teaching would be a very attractive profession, mm -hmm. and that you may find that PhD graduates or students with yeah, honours degrees teach. would want to go into teaching if, if you know, if, if, if we raise the status and the profile of teaching generally as a profession, and I think that's, that's one issue. Uh, a second issue that I think uh, people come up against is, um, is, yes, students learn best by doing, you know, students want to be inspired by real world applications, they want, um, they want to go and take tools of laboratories, they want to interact with real scientists, but the curriculum is very dense, and this is another thing I hear from teachers, is that our curriculum is so dense and there's so much shoved in there that they have to cram for exams, that we actually don't have the space to explore and learn by doing and do all these exciting, inspirational, you know, high level things, because um, people are having to cram for exams, and so, um, so I think that there's, there's a few structures structural, fundamental things that could be done um, and, um, right, and to address those. And I'm hoping that the national curriculum will, you know, help um, in that way. Mm. And, um, but I think that uh, one, you know, one idea that's floating around at the moment is actually to try and look at how to uh, attract science graduates into a teaching as a profession. And, you know, if there's ways that we could maybe create a teaching fellowship to get PhD graduates, you know, to, to maybe move into the educational sector. Um, and then and that, that might, you know, solve some of the problems about not being able to see a career. It's like, well, I want to do a PhD, I want to contribute to knowledge, and I want to do research. And then I know that after that, there is actually going to be more of an array of, of career options open to me that aren't just, um, aren't just research. Because, I mean, you might say, oh, there's not many jobs in science, and um, the majority of people who do PhDs don't end up in research. And it's like, but again, we have to redefine that. That's not failure. That's, you know, you've, you've done your PhD. You've, you've, you've 
discovered what, you know, you, you've made your contribution to knowledge, and then you've gone and worked in industry. If we had more PhDs who could go into industry, if we had more PhDs who could go into education, if having a PhD was actually seen as a qualification that, that could be used to diversify career outcomes, not just focus on staying in academia. I think, I think we, we could really um, change that perception that there's no jobs in science. Andrew. Look, I, I just think, too, that, um, you know, there's, there's just so many sources of information f for kids out there these days, and, and science is, is failing to compete. You know, you can't, I don't think we can rely on teachers as being the only source of inspiration for our kids in science anymore. They've just got access to a whole world of competitive information that will draw them into other careers. And I think it's, you know, up to people like us in, in universities and institutes and companies, people who are inspired by science, to really participate in that process, inspire the kids to take up scientific careers and work with the teachers to encourage them into science. If we just leave it to the teachers, it'll be tough for them. You know, we, we have to get involved, we have to support programs, we have to give our time to make sure that you know, those, those kids that we want to choose science over accounting or, or something like that make the decision to go down the science pathway. Gus, we have got a new science high school, haven't we? What's it called again? It's not that one. <laughs> there is a right. new science right. high school at Monash University, but there is something that's called the Nossel High School, right. which is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure it has good science as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay, question. Thank you very much. I'm interested in knowing your reactions to the finding of the Supreme Court in the United States about patenting cells and so on, and I was wondering if there's, there seems to be a division of opinion. I was wondering if you'd elucidate for the amateur what's involved, the issues are, and, and where do you think we should go? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was... Uh, uh, the, the Human Genome Project is generally attributed to uh, two fathers. Uh, there was the European side and there was the American side, and uh, the uh, great director of the NIH, uh, Francis Collins, is uh, graced as being the father of the American side. but. It was, in fact, James D. Watson of Watson and Crick fame that was the originator of the Human Genome Project in the United States. And guess what? When it was said that you could patent human genes, he resigned. He gave up the job and resigned. And I absolutely agree with him. And a patent is for an invention. A patent immediately has embedded in the idea usefulness and application. And I think it is quite wrong to be able to patent a gene. However, if you find there is a substance made by the human body that is useful, and we might take as an example interferon, you know, which is a uh, multiplicity of uses uh, in human medicine. That I think you can patent. But I don't think you should be able to patent a sequence of nucleotides just because it's a gene. And I think that's what the Supreme Court in the United States has now ruled. Obviously, there'll be shades of grey in between, and the BRCA1, BRCA2 story is a complex story, and we have to remember that myriad genetics did in fact allow people licences for free for the cancer genes for female breast cancer. But uh, I think it is right that one should not be able to patent a gene. Any other responses from the panel before I take the other questions? Look, look I think, uh, th just to simplify the point Gus was making there, is that, that there is essentially what might be referred to as a normal gene, and then there is uh, the case of the gene that has been mutated or altered, and that in turn leads to the development of a disease. And, and I think where you've, your scientists have played a role in identifying that difference and have spent many years developing ways to rapidly determine whether that difference exists in one individual uh, compared to another, then that, that in itself is a discovery and, and that should be patentable and, and it's the pattern that, that drives that level of innovation. So I think there are subtle differences there. Crystal. I think when some of those original patents for like the BRCA1 genes were, were, um, were 
granted in the 90s. I mean, uh, genomic medicine, uh, genomic science has come so far in that 20 years. And I think that at the time when those patents were granted um, was a very different time in perception as to what we sort of perceive, you know, genomic information as now. And so I think that's a really interesting space um, as we move into genomic medicine. Like, you know, if you could go and have your genome sequenced to help diagnose um, for your potential risk of disease and illness, I think that that, that has opened up a, a whole new space. Into, and I think that we're going to see far more sophisticated approaches to gene patents now, and, um, and a lot of those early patents um, that were granted in the 90s are actually about to expire. So, um, so I think that um, with the turnover of time that we will become more sophisticated about how we, we go about that patenting process. I'm about to embark on a doctorate in commercialising biotechnology. I've got a question about proximity. Uh, you've all said how important it is that you're all close to each other, and I'm interested, has that proximity been completely organic? or has there been any support either on, from the City of Melbourne, the State of Victoria, at any sort of governmental level to act, actively support that proximity and develop a biotechnology, Melbourne as a biotechnology hub? Okay, Peter. Well, one could argue, for example, that funding from the Commonwealth to establish a thing like the Doherty Institute, which will co-locate people from Melbourne Health, and the University Department of Microbiology and Immunology is, is in part done to try to create or facilitate those synergies. And I think the, the Brain Center is another example already operational of that. But at the same time, I, I don't think you know, the proximity argument alone would have carried the day to secure the funding for those institutions. There has to be the scientific substance or the medical substance behind it and the proximity is a, a, a tangential benefit in a sense. I think the, the state government for, for an extended period has had, had you know, a strong focus on creating a hub, a biotechnology hub in Melbourne and, and they've supported that in various ways, probably over the last 15 to, to 20 years. So, so really strong support from the state government over a long period for that particular... And, and the state government obviously worked hard to get the synchrotron to Victoria yep. and clearly that was part of also generating a hub, I, I presume. And all, all of the development in, in, in Parkville, the state governments contributed to that and played a major role in that process as well. So it's not entirely organic is the, the, the answer I think there. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, two questions and that's related to my background as an economist and a lot of my friends are scientists, my sister's done a PhD in organic chemistry. So the first question is related to proximity and seeing my sister's experience as an inorganic chemist where a lot of this, the stuff that she used in her experiments were imported. And so my question is more in that context and proximity, proximity to resources from the rest of the world which you use in your experiments. So a lot of it's very expensive to import and it really, really frustrates the, resource, you know, the experiments that she has to do because she has to be so careful in how she uses them. So I'm wondering how that impacts on when you do your own experiments um, you know, and how that affects the risk in, in undertaking an experiment. My second question also flows from that and that's related to... Um, the, I find that with, with science it doesn't have a strong voice compared to other industries. Um, so what do you think, how does, how does science have a better voice in the face of a lot of lobby groups from other industries um, and as well as a very highly politicised agenda when it comes to some of the most important you know, res research that's happening around the world? Um, example, climate change. Thanks. Okay, so we'll take the first question first, which is, I suppose, about the tyranny of distance in a way, that Australia, while we might have a great group of minds here, if there's a particular resource or equipment that comes from a long way away. Is that an issue that, uh, that you've struck? Yeah. Um, I do find I spend a lot of my time as a researcher uh, applying for import permits, yes. <laughs> um, because That's why you're so excited about all those mosquitoes growing. I, we are, yeah. well, I'm very excited to have mosquitoes growing next door, yes. Um, and, uh, but I think that represents the, the international kind of um, nature of science. I mean, we talk about the proximity effect locally to generate um, and accelerate innovation and knowledge, but I think that we have to acknowledge that science is, is actually a global endeavour and that, that we do actually, as well as coming from our hub here, we do actually exchange quite significantly all across the globe. So, so I, I think that um, Australia doesn't really... We don't have our, a large um, sort of chemical pharmaceutical company which we can order our reagents from locally um, 
That's apart right. from CSL. <laughs> we no. do get a lot of stuff from them. No, we don't do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, generally, I mean, that is, that is a, you, you can actually have your experiments held up by a couple of weeks because something's out of stock and, and you've ordered it from a company and they've got to get it from the States and, yeah, and you've got a six-week wait. So that is actually a tyranny of distance that we do face as researchers in Australia. I think, um, oh, sorry. No, uh, <laughs> the, um, Just the demand is, com because Australia is small, like population, we're a small country, we're far away, there are just enough, not enough demand for big pharmaceutical companies to actually generate chemicals in Australia, which is a shame, it's very frustrating. We pay Australia tax, so a lot of the things that were about one third of the price that I bought in America would be <laughs> very expensive um, if bought from here just because it's from Australia. So that is frustrating, and unless our science really grows, it's not gonna change, I don't think. Um, your second point, um, well, I, let, let's finish oh, on the first one, because I think, Peter, you had something, and then we'll come to the second yeah, one. I, I think there are some things we have to do, or we have to learn how to do, or be willing to invest in them. We can't do everything. But I think, for example, of any use of radioisotopes, if you have a radioisotope with a half-life of four days you want to use in an experiment, it's pointless buying it from Amersham in the UK, <laughs> because by the time you've got it through here and through customs, there's practically nothing left. Mm. Uh, you can either choose to go elsewhere and do the experiments, but if it's uh, patient-based, you need to do it here. And so we have Anstow and we have the facility at Lucas Heights so that we can generate some of those things. So we have to be prepared to invest in some of those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say, however, flipping it around, is what research I do, and uh, it's not my day job these days, but I still do some, um, I have the luxury of being able to do it anywhere. I can be at a conference as I was um, last week in Norway and still run calculations here in Melbourne because if you do it on a computer, and I'm not saying all science should be done on a computer, but there is an advantage to doing it on the computer. Mm. And that's where proximity doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. All right, let's, let's go to the second part of the question, which is getting science a stronger voice, that science is a bit drowned out, and particularly when sometimes the science is controversial, as in the case of or disputed, as in the, or where it poses fundamental questions about the way we run our lives, as in the case of climate change. Gus. Uh, look, I think that is a very good question. Uh, it's puzzled me down the decades why uh, tertiary education and science and research so rarely becomes a political issue in this country. But things are changing. And for the first time, we have, uh, as was mentioned previously, both the government and the opposition coming out with science policies, statements of principle, statements of what they will and will not do. Uh, it's pretty interesting because somehow primary and secondary school education have always been political. They've been, you know, mm. Gonski will be a big part of this election campaign. And what a strange thing it is to hear that we're going to pay for part of Gonski by taking it out of the height of the universities. Wasn't that, apart from anything else, politically incredibly dopey? I mean, what do they take us for? Do they think we're stupid, you know? You're going to further education, but you're going to, you know, downsize university education. For the first time, I think this is going to be a political issue in Australia, and yes, we do need to have a stronger voice. Um, I guess I might have been fairly early in saying the mining boom isn't going to last forever. I've been saying that for well over 10 years. And now, what do you know? It's happened. And the stock is changes down the tubes and everybody's saying, what are we going to do uh, now that the minerals uh, boom is, is essentially over? The answer is, it's got to be high tech. It's got to be information based, knowledge based, the knowledge economy, services based on knowledge, uh, uh, products based on knowledge. And, you know, I, I do think the science and R&D community should have a stronger voice. Isn't it interesting that there's no scientists in Parliament? Mm -hmm. There's plenty of lawyers, plenty of accountants, even a few doctors, no one from science. Barry Jones was the last science minister that really knew anything about science. Yeah. Peter. Um, this is exactly the point I was, was 
wanting to make. About 15 years ago, or for some period, around 15 years ago, there was one person with a PhD in the American Congress, Vern Ehlers. And the reason he got into it, he was a physicist, uh, was that he used to complain constantly in the presence of his local congressman about how poorly the universities were treated and so forth. And eventually, this congressperson who was retiring said, well, if you care so much about this and it's so important, why don't you get into Congress and do something about it instead of coming in here, busting my chops every couple of months? And Ayla's went away and thought about it, and the one thing he didn't really know how to do was how to run for Congress. So we went back to talk to this chap, and the chap said, well, you know, are you a Democrat or a Republican? <laughs> and Ayla's looked at him for a while and said, what, what, what are you? And the chap said, I'm a Republican. And Ayla said, well, okay, I think I'll be a Republican. <laughs> but he got elected, and he made some difference to science policy during the Clinton years and so forth. And this is, this, this general unwillingness of scientists to be distracted from doing science mm -hmm. by getting engaged with politics and politicians is a problem. Okay, Crystal, you've so, got engaged with I, um, issues. I asked myself this exact same question, why doesn't science have a stronger voice? And I asked myself this um, a few years ago um, when, we know, when we thought that there may be budget cuts. And so I've actually spent the last couple of years trying to find you know, and help scientists to have a voice. Um, I was really enthused last week um, when a lot of the uh, uh, science... Um, uh, advocacy bodies of Australia and the science agencies all came together um, as one a research alliance to sort of launch and the, launch in Canberra a, uh, a combined statement calling on both sides of government, of all sides of government, to, um, to endorse a longer view for science research. So the Australian Academy of Science, Science Technology Australia, Universities Australia, the G of 8, the regional universities, all the Australian Society for Medical Research all came together, all in the one place in Canberra and I was there at Parliament House when they launched their, their statement and and so science the science sector is starting to come together and um, is starting to have a stronger voice. Uh, one thing I'm quite keen on is looking at how to engage younger scientists, um, how to engage, uh, you know, uh, early to mid-career researchers, because we do hear from Sir Gus Nossel, and, uh, and, and as an eminent and well-known uh, scientist, you would have, you know, been able to knock on the doors of, um, of, of some of the uh, decision makers in Australia, um, but I also think that, that as well as having senior people like yourself, I think that it's really important that younger scientists start to visit their MPs, uh, write letters, who, to start um, engaging and standing up for science, and not only scientists, I think that in, it's important to identify the people in the community who benefit from science, so, you know, finding patient advocacy groups you can stand up and say, you know, um, muscular dystrophy has affected my family and I believe that this research needs funding or you know you find people who can who who are the sort of the the, the people who benefit from the research who can actually communicate to government as well their, their their support so I think that um there are it is changing the science sector is coming together and I think that I'd like to see science um on the agenda as, as an election issue um, Melbourne's pretty well known as a uh, a sporting city and uh probably its culture's very well known as well. I work for the city of Melbourne. We're trying to promote Melbourne so that its reputation as a knowledge city is equal to that of its reputation as a, a sporting city and a, a cultural city. Last week we had a workshop and in fact um, we found that there were 40 scientists working out of the herbarium at the uh, uh, Royal Botanic Gardens which is something which uh, I wasn't aware of and I don't think many other people were. Within the science sector, I think the different areas, the biotechnology sector knows itself, is well regarded you know, in the, in, on the world stage and probably even the local stage, but I think collectively, as a science city, I don't think Melbourne itself recognises itself as a science city. You know, the community of Melbourne and probably you know, beyond that how can we raise that profile? How can we make it recognised as a science city so it matches its sporting reputation or its cultural reputation? Who's got the answer? Gus? Uh, look, I'll just give you one answer. That herbarium situation doesn't surprise me. In my retirement, uh, one of the things that I've done and very much enjoyed doing is doing work for the Department of Primary Industries in respect of uh, research strategies. 
And now, of course, we have DEPI, the Department of Environment and Primary Industries. And I used to say to those scientists there, and they are large in number, you are Victoria's best kept secret. Everybody knows CSIRO. But who knows the brilliant work that DPI is doing on things like drought resistant wheat, on frost resistant uh, uh, plants, on subterranean uh, clover that is going to be uh, resistant to the major viruses and so forth. This is just a few examples of brilliant work being done right here in Melbourne uh, at DPI. And by the way, if any of you have the chance, you really should go and see the new $288 million building at La Trobe University, brand new building, which houses, amongst others, these uh, DEPI scientists, as well as some professors from La Trobe. It is architecturally, without doubt, the most beautiful and amazing science building that I've ever seen. So, Victoria's best kept secret. What have we got to do? We've got to do things like we're doing tonight. You know, we've got to talk about it. And by the way, the scientists themselves, just like Crystal said, have got to creep out of their silos and be prepared to engage with the public. I think it's a terrific idea that the younger scientists, for example, should go and talk in schools. Yeah, I do a lot of talking in schools because now I've got the time. But wouldn't it be fantastic if a 28-year-old Gus Dossel came and did three or four talks a year at one or another of the high schools. You know, the kids love it. So we've got to get out of our silos and begin to communicate. Like I think, better those things that were mentioned, the, the sport and the various cultural events, uh, they're very good at promoting themselves. Yeah. They, they spend a lot of their dollars back into promotion. And, yeah. and as scientists, that's, we're not comfortable doing that mm -hmm. and, and we don't do it very well, but we've got to get better at it and we've got to get more comfortable at it and we've got to do things like this and get out into the schools and into the community and talk about you know, the, the, the benefits and values of science. I think scientists are actually yeah, very uncomfortable with self-promoting in the public. They don't want to look arrogant or, you know, um, and also I do think that there is the perception if you do late, uh, I mean, public lectures and science communication um, to non-scientists that you're sort of cheating on science or you know you're not doing what you're called to do and I think that perception needs to change and not only that I actually think that science communication should be made mandatory if you have won grants and prizes not just something that is extracurricular that may win you a couple of points which is what it is at the moment I think in the grant system but there should be extra waiting for successful communication extra there. waiting mm. as well as actually just make it mandatory mm. you should do a certain amount mm. everybody should do a certain amount to communicate their science in a language that people can understand. So um, in the United Kingdom, a lot of grants are actually um, have a communication element tied into them. So that if you are awarded a grant, you are using the taxpayer's money. Yeah. Um, we, we are, you know, funded by our community. And so I think that an essential part of being a science and, and I think tied into the granting process should be that, you know, that, that you share and communicate that knowledge. But that will only come if, as you say, she, yeah, make it's, it mandatory. <laughs> it, it's seen as something that is an integral part of being a scientist, not just something that you do on the side. OK, I'm going to wind this up there. Thank you all very much for attending this evening. This discussion was brought to you by Melbourne Conversations, the City of Melbourne's program of free public forums in association with future leaders. Thank you again for attending this evening. Don't, don't forget to grab your... What is this, Peter? That is a polio virus. There and you go. it's graphics of a polio virus that some researchers we work with actually build inside the computer so they can experiment with it within the computer. And it's built basically from the individual atoms, millions of them. There you go. So you can get your own, if there's any left, polio virus up the back. <laughs> take it home and assemble it. Um, thank you again for attending this evening on a cold Melbourne winter evening. And please join me in thanking our very generous five scientists who've given up their time this evening. Uh, Sir Gustav Nossel, Crystal Evans, uh, Andrew Nash, Ji Hoon Kim, and uh, Professor Peter Taylor. Thank you all very much. <laughs>